the other day I was uh, in a conversation with a man in his 80s um, and I can't even quite remember how we got to this point but I noticed there was like a tear forming in his eye and uh, I knew that this was one of those those moments uh, one of those times when you you, you mustn't rush, rush past yeah there was a like an invite just to stop and be quiet it was a tender moment you know a time of just standing what I call on a sacred ground you know with with the other person this in this case this man he was drifting pondering and reflecting on the stories that seemed to come like waves on his life and, and I, I didn't not interrupt where I believe spirit was dancing him into. It was only for about 10 seconds, maybe not even that, but but then he he opened up and spoke about loss, uh, the loss of uh, deep friendships, relationships, um, opportunity lost to connect with at least one other man, uh, to have a friend. He He talked about his observation that the woman seemed to have more friends and deeper relationships. Uh, there was a grief that he had not had this, and and then we moved on. Um, perhaps we will come back to it one day. I hope we do. But I've been to like many places, <laughs> physical places that have the term sacred ground attached to them, and it might be a place of some uh, religious significance. It could be some place of pilgrimage that people pilgrim or walk to, or travel to. Um, maybe even a, a sports arena <laughs> or stadium where someone has achieved some great sporting feat. And this is sacred ground. Um, we connect the, the term sacred ground with the words, this is where dot 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 happened. Um, but I also believe that um, there can be sacred ground moments within our conversations. A moment in a conversation where we could say this is where dot dot happened. Moments when um, a space opens up for silence and listening and there's an invite to intimacy and it's in to me see. <laughs> and, and that invite is quietly given. Have you, have you noticed these things yourself? But you know so often I find people are scared sort of when they, they touch the outskirts of a sacred space. You know, shields up, do do do, alarm cell, <laughs> and they back off, or they, they, they divert off to other topics. They, they avoid, 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 I don't want to go there. And, and the brain, in all its um, uh, hardwired, self-protected goodness, shouts, this sacred ground feels more like quicksand that could swallow me up. <laughs> but sacred places are places that where there's often um, a pivot of change can happen. You know, it's like a, a place where um, we can see change in our lives actually take place. And there's a story in the Bible about a sacred space conversation. And it happened around a fire. And it was a, there was this desert bush. Um, a, it was a blaze. But the strangest thing was that the bush wasn't turning to ash. It wasn't being consumed it was just fully alive with fire and this drew attention from um, a wandering shepherd by the name of Moses and I'll just read you the passage Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro his father-in-law the priest of Midian and he heard the flock he, he led the flock <laughs> to the west of the wilderness and came to the mountain of um, God Horeb and the angel of God appeared to him in flames of fire blazing out of the middle of a bush. And he looked. Whoa! <laughs> the bush was blazing away, but it didn't burn up. Moses said, what's going on here? I can't believe this. Amazing. Why doesn't the bush burn up? <laughs> and God saw that he had stopped to look. And God called him from out of the bush. Moses, Moses. He said, yes, I'm right here. And God said, don't come any closer. Remove your sandals from your feet. You're standing on holy ground. You know, I, I think of my conversation that I, that I talked about right at the start of this. And the desire for me to come in closer, dig deeper, ask questions and push the story on. I wanted to know more what was going on in this guy's life. Yet, 
um, the best choice was not to come closer, but actually, in a kind of funny way, to remove my sandals and be silent. You know, many people have conjecture as to why Moses had to remove his sandals. Sure, he was instructed to because this was holy ground, but, but why? Well, I want to offer a suggestion. Look, I wear footwear all the time in the garden. Boots, shoes, sandals are all worn to uh, protect my feet from connection to the earth. You know, and without that layer of protection, um, my feet will get dirty <laughs> and possibly harmed by uh, thorns and stones. So I wear shoes to protect myself, to keep something between myself and potential harm. So I wonder if God was saying, um, look, I don't want anything to come between yourself and the dirt and the dustiness of this place. I want you to connect fully with the earth of this experience. Um, have no crafted, man-made structure that acts as a barrier. I wonder if that's what God was saying to Moses. You see, uh, sacred ground has an invite to dig your toes into it. There is a vulnerability to this moment and you need to be part of it. Now, what is it like for you to walk barefooted on soil? You know, when those moments happen, we so often rush to fill the void, don't we, when someone exposes pain. It makes us feel uncomfortable, so we think, right, let's fix their problem. Uh, here's some good advice that they need to take. <laughs> um, I can save them from that. Or they need to be straightened out. And you might also f swing into your favourite uh, space-filling uh, therapeutic technique. You know, perhaps if you're a counsellor, therapist, spiritual director, pastor, you've been taught what to do in those moments to follow such and such a practice. Well, I think in those moments of sacred ground, you need to walk very carefully, tenderly, quietly. Uh, take your sandals off as such. Uh, feel your vulnerability and what Christ is in you. You know, this is a moment to watch and wait. Watch for where they go. Are they running away from the sacred ground? Or are they wanting to dig their toes in with you? If um, they run, perhaps a gentle question that asks about their sacred ground is needed. A reassurance that running and avoidance are normal. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> but that the sacred ground has an invite to depth. And the sacred ground has answers that our heart needs to hear. You know, and of course, God is in the business of bringing us to burning bushes. <laughs> Moments of grabbing our attention and pulling us aside to commune. I've been recently reading um, Job and the Mystery of Suffering by Richard Raw, and there was a quote in there that just grabbed my attention. And this is it. Conversion, which is forever refining the most intimate nature of our experience, is a long, long process. Okay, a bit of emphasis from me there. It's a long, long process. And it goes on, more a long road to Emmaus than a one-time road to Damascus. I'll read that again. More long road to Emmaus than a one-time road to Damascus. You know, and I immediately thought of those two roads, you know, the Emmaus Road, where the two followers of Jesus walked and talked out the mystery of what had happened in Jerusalem. And then someone, who happened to be Jesus, joined them and answered their questions. It actually challenged them quite a lot too. <laughs> and then there's the Damascus Road, where Saul uh, travelled, you know, with a hatred, murderous and murderous intent to kill people, much like our pilgrims on the Emmaus Road. Um, and Jesus joined him too, but with an explosion of light. Highly confrontational. <laughs> and so much light that it, that it threw him to the soil beneath his feet. And perhaps on our Emmaus Road journey of conversion, Raw says, which is forever the refining, the most intimate nature of our experience, <laughs> we also have Damascus Road experiences. Um... They may not be as dramatic as Saul. I hope that not, but sometimes they are. Um, is what Saul experienced, but might be classified as little Damascus Road moments. Uh, micro burning bush, sacred ground, 
sh sandal shedding times. <laughs> and those little millimetre moments that invite us to pause and pivot. Times like I experienced in the conversation where my friend was invited to the sacred ground. Where he was, um, had a little Damascus re revelation. You know, those early followers of Jesus walking home to Emmaus had many, I believe, small little Damascus road events where they had their thinking gently challenged and redirected. They were walking on sacred ground and they didn't even know it until the end of the journey. And then they realised how their hearts had burned within them. Mm. Perhaps they were had encountered a burning bush that didn't turn to ash. See, I am praying that I might see more of those conversational sacred ground moments. Those little instants where you know spirit is dancing and weaving into the conversation. Uh, perhaps there might be more tears. Times when I notice the conversation, the movement of the conversation to a place where it's been sacred. I hope I don't rush it or invade it. Uh, instead, the invite is to linger and listen. And love does that. Here's some quotes to think about. God's healing has more to do with learning to worship than it does with getting life fixed. Craig Barnes. The pain of something old falling apart, disruption and chaos, invites the soul to listen at a deeper level. It invites and sometimes forces the soul to go to a new place because the old place is not working anymore. Richard Raw. When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives mean the most to us, we often find it is those who, instead of giving advice, solutions or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. I'm right now. Real encouragement occurs when words are spoken from a heart of love to another's recognised fear. Larry Crabb. And a good journey begins with knowing where we are and being willing to go somewhere else. Richard Raw. <laughs> Learn to respond to others with open and honest questions instead of counsel or corrections. With such questions we help hear each other into deeper speech. I love that. Richard, uh, Parker Palmer. Good work is relational and it come, it, its outcomes depend on what we are able to evoke from each other. Parker Palmer. It is usually most helpful to ask questions that are more about the person than about the problem. Parker Parker. And some questions for you to think about. Have you noticed those sacred ground moments in conversations? Number two, why do we rush to solve a problem? Number three, when have you entered a personal sacred ground? That place where memories swirl and time drifts to uncomfortable places. What is your response? Do you run? Do you take off your sandals? Do you listen? Hey, uh, I hope you found this helpful um, and that uh, you might be a bit more tuned into listening to sacred ground moments where, yeah, there's an invite uh, to listen and to learn and to lean in. Um, and uh, perhaps you might want to do that with me. Um, I, I'm listening to people from all over the world now. Um, via my, um, I suppose it's coaching, of course it's pastoral direction, spiritual direction, I don't know what you want to call it, but we have good conversations. If you want to do that, that would be wonderful. Just email me, barry at turningthepage.co.nz. Hey, and thanks so much for watching or listening again. And um, yeah, big shout out and big thank you to those people who are my Patreon supporters who um, help fund Turning the Page. They're wonderful people. <laughs> if you want to learn to be one of those wonderful people, it's uh, turningthepage.co.nz forward slash support. Hey, until next week, listen for the sacred ground. Amen. Bye.